Good afternoon. Welcome to worship this afternoon. We're glad you all are here worshiping with us, and we welcome any guests or visitors that are with us today. We also welcome all those who are worshiping with us online as this service is being streamed online as well. As we'll be ending this service with in silence and then also beginning and ending tomorrow's service or Good Friday in silence, I just want to take the time to uh, announce when those services will be. So tomorrow we will have our Good Friday service, one at noon and one at 6 p.m. And then on Easter, we will have a Easter service at 745 and then also at 930 a.m. Those are identical services and no service on Saturday then. Our theme for today's service is his final steps led towards the upper room. As we look at, the, uh, look at what we, God has to tell us from his word, I invite you all to take what we learned today and apply it to your lives as we're going through Holy Week and the w weeks and months to come. We continue with the opening hymn, hymn number 550, Lamb of God. <laughs> stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in this Lenten season we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led him to the cross for our salvation. We have also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus, our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. 
We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, first instituted on this night, the members of Christ's body participate most in intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's last supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness and participate in the new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. As we continue the solemn celebration of our Lord's Passion, let us confess our sins to him, receive his absolution, and be reconciled to God and each other in Christian love. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Of our Lord Jesus Christ does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. He sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on a cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, 
The Lord Jesus, on the night, he, night when he was betrayed, took bread. And we had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. The word of the Lord. We continue with, with hymn number 669. We will be singing along with a recording by the mixed choir. second reading comes from John chapter 13. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, you do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, 
A person who has a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right because I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also will do just as I have done for you. A new command I give you. Love one another just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. The word of the Lord. We continue with the next hymn, hymn number 525, The Lamb. stand. The 
The sermon text for this Thursday during Holy Week is taken from Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. His disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he arrived with the twelve. This is God's holy word. Please be seated. May the words and doings of our Lord Jesus in the upper room strengthen us and encourage us in our Christian faith. Dear friends, if you would travel to the Holy Land today, travel to Israel, you would probably run into a good number of tour guides. And if you used any of them, they would take you to places that they would say something happened, an event happened that's related to the life of Jesus on this earth. They would take you to a place maybe and say, that's where Jesus fed the more than 5,000 people. That's where exactly where he healed the blind man. That's where he was born. That's where he died on the cross. They'll say we have, and we know the exact place. That's where also his tomb is. Now, most of the places, the exact places are gone with the past. And that, that's true when it comes also to the upper room. We don't know exactly where it was, but that's okay. No problem with that, because what is most important is what happened in that upper room. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to walk with Jesus, his final steps, to the upper room. That's where the disciples diligently and carefully prepared the Passover meal. And that's where Jesus diligently and carefully prepared for his coming death. When you visit the upper room, like we're doing today on this Holy Thursday, you generally think about the Lord's Supper. And that's wonderful because the Lord's Supper is a highlight of that evening in the upper room. We just love hearing the words, don't we? Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood of the new covenant or New Testament, which is poured out for many. We travel to the upper room then in spirit, and we can't wait to hear Jesus' words. We, we think about the Lord's Supper and what a blessing it is, how here we have a tangible look at the gospel. We're able to taste and see and smell this tangible gospel that God has given to us. And then we hear the words of Jesus, those words, for you, for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. This sermon, however, is going to take on a different emphasis. We're going to take a look at the setting, the overall setting of the upper room. We're not going to sweep away, of course, the Lord's Supper. You know better than that. You know that all through this service already we've been emphasizing the Lord's Supper. We emphasized preparing for it as we confessed our sins together, came humbly to the Lord with repentant hearts. And then we heard that absolution and we look forward to it as we receive the Lord's Supper. You know that the hymns, Many of them have already been talking about the Lord's Supper. The readings, we've heard about the Lord's Supper. And then we're going to receive that Holy Supper for the forgiveness of our sins. So we're not sweeping it away at all. But we do want to take a look at the overall scene of the upper room. Because so much was going on in that upper room. 
talks about preparation. It's not that the Lord's Supper just fell out of the sky. The Lord's Supper is deeply rooted in the Old Testament, in the Passover. You know about that Passover, how God, with that tenth plague, finally brought out the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt and put them on their way to the promised land. And that last plague, they were told, paint the doorposts of your home with the blood of the Lamb. And the angel of death will pass over. Yes, the Passover was a celebration of God rescuing his people from that Egyptian slavery. But it also looked ahead, didn't it? To the Savior who would come as the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. Whose blood would be shed on the cross. Wow, there's such a connection. The Lord's Supper deeply rooted in the Old Testament, in the Passover. And Jesus was fulfilling the Passover as he ate it with his disciples. And right after that, he gave the New Testament supper, the Lord's Supper. There was much fresh preparation that went into the Passover. It just astounds us as you read about all that went into it. Two disciples were dispatched in order to go to the city and find an owner who would show them, as it says, a large upper room furnished and ready. So there were preparations already made by the owner of the room. And then the two disciples were to make further preparations. This took hours. Hours. Think of all the details, but then we come to the centerpiece of the Passover. The lamb. The lamb was to be chosen. The lamb was then to be slaughtered on that day. And the lamb would be roasted. Hours of preparation. It's just, you, you couldn't just go out to a Jewish deli and buy a pre-roasted lamb. They had to prepare it meticulously. And it took time. A lot of work went into this. It boggles our minds. If you really take a look at all that was part of this, boggles the minds of people today because, you know, you could take a piece of pizza and put it into your microwave in a few seconds, it's warm. But oh, what was going on with this meal, the Passover, involved a whole lot of preparation. What about the task of finding the room? You remember, I had mentioned at another sermon, during another sermon, that there were probably around two million people in Jerusalem. And Jesus is now looking for an upper room. But he knew about it ahead of time, of course. He is the Son of God, Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. So th this wasn't a daunting task for the Lamb of God who intended to make these final steps to the upper room. This was not a daunting task for the Lamb of God who looked to, as it says in Luke, recline at the table with the twelve apostles. This was not a daunting task for the Lamb of God who said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This was not a daunting task because this was according to the plan. The plan of God. Nothing could fail here. It is what had been written from eternity. Peter and John, they were the ones dispatched in order to go into Jerusalem with directions to get things ready. Go into the city, Jesus said, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will then show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So it was no accident that this upper room was available. This was according to plan. It was a fail-safe plan because it's God's plan. So they went and they found it exactly like Jesus said. Strange to us, though, isn't it? It's 
kind of overwhelming because Jesus said, go into the city with all these people and you will find a man carrying a jar of water. Meet him and follow him. He'll show you the upper room. All because of God's plan. And Jesus fulfilling that plan 100%. Every single point, without fail, he was fulfilling the plan of God to save us. So we see then, as Jesus makes these steps to the upper room, that those disciples meticulously and carefully, diligently prepared the Passover meal. And Jesus was fulfilling it as he ate it with them. One last time, this is it, no more, because now the Lamb of God is going to the altar of the cross. As we take a look at this section, we also see how Jesus is meticulously, carefully planning for his death. As we see from the scriptures here, our Lord meticulously plans for his death as he deviates from the usual during the Passover. Some strange words, even shocking words, are coming out of Jesus at the upper room. For example, Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Referring, of course, to Judas. And then, what did he do up in that upper room? He washed the feet of his disciples. We heard that. Showing how he had come to serve, not to be served. He was showing love and humility, and he wants his people, you and I also, to live with humble hearts, serving one another. Think about the disciples and what they must have thought as Jesus then moved from the Passover into something else. What is this that Jesus is giving to us now? Those words, of course, of the Holy Supper, here they have it, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Amen, I tell you, I will certainly not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus then instituting the Lord's Supper. Something else that occurred that evening as the disciples were warned. This night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. All of this happening in that large upper room. Jesus giving so many words, doing so much. It's good that we look at the overall setting here. And there in those words, he was referring, of course, to when he would go out to the garden. And he would be taken captive, taken away, and the disciples would run away. They would desert him. What about Peter? What did Jesus say to Peter? He said, Amen, I tell you, today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me or deny me three times. It was also in the upper room that he gave that command. It used to be called, we used to use that word all the time, mandi. It means mandate or command. And it referred to, to this command as well, where Jesus said in that upper room, a new commandment I give you, love one another, just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love, have love for one another. We see more of the Savior's words, and as we listen to them, we can see the Lamb's legacy here. Really, we could look at it also as his last will and testament. Here he is spending some time, some hours with his disciples and today with us. And he's leaving us with wonderful, comforting words for our troubled heart. This is where he said those words, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. This is where he gave those words of life when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. This is where he also gave those words of peace, where he tells us that there's peace now between God and us because of what he's done. 
for us when he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let it be afraid. Wow, so many doings and so many words Jesus shared. And every one important how good it is that we're taking this overall look. And Jesus really wanted to be with his disciples in that upper room. And it was planned, planned from eternity. He had this secluded spot, this spot where they wouldn't be disturbed by their enemies. This time when he'd have a few hours with his disciples, a time where he took the time to prepare for his death by talking to his disciples, and he's talking to us now. And he said here also, my time is near. My time is near. We've been walking with Jesus all the way through the season, walking to different places. Today we've gone to a place we've been comforted by the words of Jesus. We've seen what he's done and what he's given to us and how blessed we are. We've gone to the upper room with him, those final steps to the upper room. A and we'll continue on making those final steps to the garden. We'll make those steps to Judas, betraying him, those steps to Pontius Pilate, those steps to his way to the cross, carrying his own cross, the steps to the cross. We follow Jesus with his final steps to the upper room and tomorrow to the place of the skull. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we give our offerings to our Lord, we want them always to come from our hearts of faith and love for the Savior, showing love to God and also for one another. As the offering baskets are brought forward, we dedicate all of them to our Lord God, those given here, those given online, those sent in or dropped off. We've heard the love of Jesus, and we respond generously. Please be seated. Let us sing the offering hymn, hymn number 416, when you woke that Thursday morning.
stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God, pictured in the ancient Passover feast. Now giving your own body and pouring out your own blood in holy communion, just as the Passover lambs assured the Israelites of God's promise to deliver them from death. Prepare us to receive this sacrament, remembering your death and repenting of our sins. We rejoice in our fellow believers who have been instructed by your word and who are now ready to receive Holy Communion. We pray for those absent from the sacrament because of their own neglect. Keep in your care those unable to receive the sacrament, often because they are homebound, hospitalized, imprisoned, serving in the military, or otherwise separated from the fellowship of believers. Encourage them so that they do not lose hope. We join in the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members of our church and church body come to Holy Communion, approach up the middle aisle and return by the side aisle. When indicated, kneel or remain standing at the rail. Receive the wafer with an open hand and take the wine cup yourself from the tray. If you'd prefer to be handed the wine cup, simply hold out your hand. Hold your wafer hand up like stop if you would like a gluten-free wafer available in a sleeve on the tray. Non-alcoholic white wine is also available in the middle of the cup tray. Cup receptacles are along the walls. If you choose the common wine cup or chalice, help by tipping it to your mouth while holding the base. The general blessing will be given at the end of Holy Communion. Please come for all things are now ready.
please stand. Now may this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith for life everlasting. Go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Now have a time of silence for meditation before the stripping of the altar. After the Last Supper, less than 24 hours remained in the earthly life of our Lord. Events moved rapidly. Prayer in the garden, betrayal by Judas, arrest, mock trial, painful beatings, floggings, ridicule, condemnation, the march to Golgotha, and finally, execution. As he was stripped and freely gave up his life, so we strip our altar and chancel area of the signs of life to symbolize Christ's purposeful, redemptive suffering and death for us. We surround our altar with plants to symbolize new life springing forth. In the passion and suffering of Christ, his human life faded from him. In recognition of this, we remove these plants from our sight. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The events of Golgotha under Christ's willingness and love snuffed out Jesus, the light of the world's human life. And this, as the sky was darkened when he suffered, so we extinguish our candles and remove them from our sight. The missile stand holds the books that guide our worship life together as we hear God's word and respond with prayers and praises back to God. As Jesus suffers, these normally joyful sounds grow quiet. As these songs of joy are removed from our lips, so we remove the altar book and the missile stand from our presence. Our altar is in the form of a table. It is here that our Lord serves us his banquet feast. He offers us his word and sacrament, and so we remove the sacramental elements. Pyramids are the cloths that cover our altar and display symbols of our God and salvation. They are finely crafted and embroidered, materials appropriate for feasting with our King. Purple, the color of Lent, also points to the purple robe Jesus wore as the soldiers mocked him. As our King's body was stripped of the purple robe and also his dignity, so our altar, pulpit, and lectern are stripped of its coverings.
our chancel and altar now empty and bare are ready for us to remember the stark realities of Christ's suffering for us on Good Friday. We will worship him in this setting tomorrow. We sing hymn 526, and then we leave quietly contemplating. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.